Michael Brinkley, that probably one of the most familiar uh, uh, people and events as far as trials go and trusting God. We will go over tonight, so it won't take very long. It's probably good because I've already used a lot of our time. Quick review, we have several pitfalls they went through, things that keep us from truly trusting God. Uh, again, those good times in our life where the lines fall on me in unpleasant places, as David said. Uh, those When we begin to trust in instruments, or we can even say people, the things that God uses uh, to meet our needs, we begin to put our trust in that instead of our God. Uh, the small things. Probably very easy when it's just a small thing. Not to uh, uh, put as much emphasis on trusting God because well, I got this, it's small. Our emotions certainly can get in the way at times. Charles, you probably, for some very large pitfall, or others maybe not as big, but certainly I think for all of us, we can allow our emotions to get in the way. Especially if you consider the realm of emotions, even as far as anger, when something goes unexpectedly and our response immediately goes into anger. Uh, obviously, that is a pitfall for our trust in our God. It, it gets in the way from that. Uh, our solutions, when I think I've already got this figured out, uh, it's amazing though how many times when we think we've got it figured out, God reminds us that we don't. Um, but that can certainly become a uh, pit, pitfall. Our own ambitions, our goals, our agendas, uh, our uh, even our survival modes at times, but uh, this is my dream, this is my passion, I'm going to go for it. Uh, uh, and sometimes we get so tunnel visioned on that that we lose sight of uh, truly just trusting in God. Again, our knowledge, kind of like our solution, but our knowledge uh, as far as I have there, knowing our risk. Uh, sometimes we conclude uh, 1 plus 1 equals 2, and I'm not trying to get into fuzzy math here, but we conclude then that uh, there's no way that anything else can work in this scenario. And in doing so, many times we move, we move God from the scenario. Not that God ever makes... 1 plus 4 equal 2, uh, but God doesn't, he doesn't, he's not limited by our knowledge. Uh, the results of trusting. Uh, again, we had a quick reminder of what our objective is before we get into this last chapter in our book. The distraction of our purpose, the expectation of our purpose, the fulfillment of our purpose, and truly trusting in our Lord, uh, delighting ourselves in the Lord. Uh, certainly our ultimate objective is to glorify God with our lives. Um, our first result is true thanksgiving. This time of year, it's easy to be thankful. Even the secular world, the unsaved world, uh, has a tendency to be thankful. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there might be the time when people just are, are, are happier about things. They'll gather around the table, perhaps, and, and uh, even discuss things that they're thankful for. But when we truly are trusting our God, it enables us to truly be thankful all year. Be thankful even when things are not going well. Because true thankfulness, beyond just a season, is not natural. And uh, choosing to trust God makes it normal, makes it natural, makes it right. Uh, then as well, we're going to look here this evening, a second kind of result of trusting our God, the aspect of worship. Now, true or false, you could probably worship our God. Well, let me, that's a great, that's a, that's a difficult question. Can you worship God without trusting God? Probably not truly worshiping him. Um, if you consider worship as in singing, even collectively, certainly I would guarantee that there are people that build church auditoriums all over the world, uh, Sundays or Saturdays or whatever day they happen to meet in different places, uh, that are worshiping at least by action, but uh, they're not trusting God. Uh, maybe they're just seeing words that are up on the screen, or maybe in many cases, sadly, they're just sitting there silently as someone else is carrying on up on the stage or the platform. Um, and, and sadly, a lot of times we assume then that I am a worshiping God. Well, the truth is, is we're not truly worshiping God until we are truly trusting God. Uh, and uh, the truly trust God enables us to truly worship our God. And uh, I think it's a reminder at times that how I worship God is directly correlated to how I trust Him. And it's not just about Sundays, Sunday services when we sing songs, and, and uh, next Tuesday when we thank God for all that He's done for us. Uh, worship is something that we truly should be doing our, the entirety of our lives, uh, Sunday through Saturday. Our, our lives should be 
a means of worshiping our God because ultimately the objective of our life is to glorify God. And uh, we do that by the very worship of God, by our heart attitude before Him. And uh, it's a challenge at times to worship when our hearts are not truly trusting. And uh, we need to be reminded of what it means to truly trust. We know the story of Job and uh, the challenges that he went through. I know I'm going to begin here in Job chapter 1, verse 13. I know we know this, uh, but I think you can't get through a whole book on trusting God without spending a little bit of time on Job. And uh, I think there's great application to us from the very familiar. But in verse 13 of chapter 1, it says, And there was a day when his son, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 16, a very important phrase here. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Another important phrase. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Here we have that phrase again. While he was yet speaking, for the fourth time, there came also another and said, The sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their, their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. I know that we've all had situations in our life that we've had a lot of those while he was yet speaking some moments where it just seems like things are snowballing. And uh, one problem after another after another, uh, probably working in most jobs, we've all lived that. <laughs> one problem at work, another one, another one, another one, another one. Um, but even in our Christian walk, even in our, in, uh, our needs and uh, just life, I'm certain that we've all faced those situations where we seem to go from one to the next to the next and there was no break. Uh, we, were, we were trying to tread water and uh, the next wave just comes in before we've gotten our breath from the last uh, uh, of the wave that came over our heads. And uh, what a, a challenge. I, let's step back. Can you imagine being these servants? All four of them. Can you imagine coming and you think you've got the worst news in the world? And you come rushing to the boss. And there's already another servant there talking to the boss. And as you run in with the worst news in the world, you overhear him giving more worst news in the world. And uh, can you imagine being the last guy uh, that has to come in and tell of, of, of death? Uh, not lost because of theft or anything along those lines of the first three reports, but uh, lost from death. And uh, having to come and say, while the last guy is still speaking, standing off to the side, waiting to give the report to the boss. Uh, growing up, uh, I, I, I think I was, uh, I was destined, I, I use that very lightly, but destined to be in uh, emergency care because I always, I, I think I did very well growing up in handling the things that I and my brothers did uh, as far as uh, the things that we did to ourselves, mutilating our physical bodies and sticking things through our bodies and falling on things that shouldn't be in our bodies and uh, whatever it also was, rocking in front of swings that also should not be inside of heads and things like that. And uh, I think I did very well and uh, growing up and uh, I, I think that there were a lot of times that um, I, th I, I would almost confidently say that there were times that my mom pretty much just handed me stuff and said, here? <laughs> and uh, I kind of ran with that. But I could say I would much rather do that. Take care of, of, of the blood and all the other things that were taking place with my again myself and my brothers than to be the one that would have to report and uh, there were times that uh, and it always seemed to be about Bob I don't know why it was always Bob John John my brother John was the one that always seemed to get hurt uh, for reasons but I always seemed to get 
the reporting job from Bob. Maybe because we always did stuff together, that's probably why. But I had to be the one to run home to tell my parents, you know, we were riding bikes, all was going well, and suddenly Bob's flying over the handlebars and uh, he's got pavement in his tooth now. And uh, there's tooth now in pavements as well. Um, I, I never enjoyed, you know, give me the rags, give me the whatever, give me the ice packs, I'll take care of it as much as I can as a, as a child, but uh, knock on the door, knock, 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 get on the door to my own home, but to go run into the house and say, Mom, <laughs> Bob needs you. <laughs> he just did a cartwheel, and we know Bob can't do cartwheels. <laughs> Uh, that was something that I never enjoyed, and, and to step into their shoes and realize that while they were, yes, speaking of the next size coming in, waiting for that report to get done to give the next report, I cannot imagine what that was like. But then stepping into the even worse shoes would be stepping into Job's shoes and realizing he's hearing the worst news of his life, and then somebody comes running through the door. And at first, I'm guessing he's hoping that maybe this is good news, but no, it's Bad news, probably worse news than the first report. And uh, as he's hearing the second one, here comes somebody through the door, running through the door with report number three. And I can't imagine, uh, literally, and I know we've, we've heard probably too many messages on the life of Job. But honestly, what would be our response at that moment after number four has come in? The number four has come in and say, not only have you lost pretty much everything you own, all of your wealth, but you've lost that which is dearest to you as well. What would be our response? Uh, what would we do next? Uh, what would be our next actions? What would be our next words? What would be our next, very next thoughts? And uh, look at verse 20 as we see what Job did. Then Job arose. and We don't have it recorded for us. And uh, I'm, I'm not trying to take liberty here, but we don't have any response from Job. We just get a report after report after report after report. I've got to think that Job was doing something besides just sitting there with his mouth wide open in between every person coming to report these things. But it says in verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head. Now those would have been things that in the Old Testament would have been the normal means of, of grieving. Uh, not normally something that we do today of, of tearing our clothes off and shaving our heads. Uh, but it would have been the norm of, of that day and age. Then Lewis, what it says at the end of verse 20, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. That's a, that's a, uh, those last two words of verse 20 is a, a challenging uh, reality. Now, the truth is, is, is in the Hebrew, the word there, fell down upon the ground, is, is literally the word that has the idea of prostate, which literally just means he fell on his face, which, again, for us, yeah, uh, that I believe, in fact, I can say this confidently, uh, there are times when turmoil of life is so overwhelming that people literally just collapse. And uh, again, from EMT days, too many times in tragic car accidents, been to the hospital, take somebody to the hospital, they are not well, I'll say it that way. Family comes and they get the news and they literally, they just collapse. They, they, just, they have no strength in them anymore. And uh, uh, so that even in and of itself is a, a normal response, but it says, and he worshipped. And we will see here in a moment in the very next verse that it wasn't just a, an action, um, but ultimately his words, well, I haven't hit anything here. His actions that he had in verse 20, which probably are going to be different actions than what most of us would do. Obviously he arose, he runs his mantle, he shaved his head, are all normal responses for that day and age. Uh, of grieving, and I think it's important to remind ourselves that uh, grieving is not something that I say this hesitant or uh, cautiously, but it's not something that is wrong. I think God created us with emotion. God created us with a means to grieve. He created us with to love, and uh, there is certainly a, a very reality that God has created us uh, with the means to grieve. Now, I know I just did a message on emotions, and I'm solely out of my, totally out of my comfort zone, talking about grieving and emotions. Uh, I'm starting to sound like, more like my brother Bob instead of uh, uh, myself. But ultimately what he's doing here is a normal response for grief. 
But what would be our normal response for what he's going through? What would I do? What would you do? What would, what would be our actions? We're just looking at the actions part. What, what would we do? Uh, oh, would our muscle just clench and just, uh, in frustration? Would we cry out to God? Maybe even in anger. Why are you doing this to me? Uh, would we just weep uncontrollably? Uh, uh, again, I can't tell you how many times hospital, family arrives. We haven't quite left yet. And uh, we're finishing up our reports, handing them over to the nurse's station, and family comes running through the door. And uh, the nurse there has the, the unfortunate responsibility of giving the news to family. And uh, I have, I've seen the whole gamut of responses, most of them not good. <laughs> uh, many of, many times, a group complete anger. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what do you want to try? Uh, the slashing out in, in their anger. And uh, cursing and uh, all kinds of responses along those lines. Well, what would we do? What would be our action? What would be our first action? And uh, I think it's great that uh, we have the reality that Job is not not somebody that um, he, he didn't immediately just say, let us now pray. <laughs> but we can see the heart of Job. We can see that this was hard for him. We can see that he arose. He, he runs his battle. He shaves his head. We also see that his first action then was to go to his face. He goes face before a, a God and he worships. He worships his God. Uh, uh, look at the words because, again, in the Hebrew it could be, well, that just means he fell on his face. Uh, the prostate and worship are two words that are almost interchangeable and uh, this could just uh, be the reality of, of any of us just falling on our face. But not only did he have action, but he had the words. Notice it says in verse 21. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Let's stop right there. Where is Job's focus to first? Maybe you missed a phrase. Himself. And this on himself. And I know I've often said, well, we shouldn't have our focus on ourselves. But notice how he has his focus on himself. What, what is ultimately, what is Job acknowledging here by his words? His actions are, he's done the normal grieve, he started the normal grieving process, but he has now fallen on his face in worship before God. And this isn't a, a he's thankful that all this happened to his family, he's thankful that he has nothing left of, of material wealth, but he's acknowledging that God's involved in this, that, that God is still one who should be and, and can be worshipped in the midst of this. But his words, by beginning with the focus on himself, even in the focus on himself, is not, woe is me. Mm -hmm. It is not, I don't deserve this. Mm -hmm. It is not, why is this happening to me? His words in his first initial response to himself is simply this. Uh, you can sum it up this way. I didn't deserve any of this. Naked I started, and naked I, I will go. And ultimately, when, as he's looking to himself, which is our, going to be our natural response. You have a scenario like Job, even just a degree of Job's. Our natural response is going to be to look inward first. And, uh, but notice Job's inward searching is the very reality that I came with nothing and I'm going to leave with nothing. And uh, I do believe that that is a challenge for I know for me, for all of us to be that kind of words of worship in the midst of great tragedy. First upon himself, but then he moves as quickly, moves his attention to God. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. What is Job acknowledging? God is in control. Now let's just step back in Job's life. We know the scenarios, but let's put them into our scenario. Let's imagine, um, well, let's do it this way. Let's make it very simple. Let's imagine someone that you have bought, maybe it's your first brand new car, because we want to make it so that it has some value. Uh, so you bought your first brand new car, and uh, someone has borrowed your brand new car and has destroyed it. That which was of great value to you simply because it was brand new. And uh, you entrusted it to somebody else, and there is nothing now to show of it. What is our response in that regard? 
know, it could have, if it were us, if it would have been the normal human response, wait a minute, time out, you mean that I had some of my servants and they were overcome by others and they allowed people to not only steal everything that I own, but they allowed themselves to get in such a, a, a situation that they themselves lost their lives? What was wrong with them? What were they doing? What were they, what were they, you know, what, what was distracting them? What was going, and, and our minds immediately go then maybe to a blame game, maybe to a, how can, why did this happen? But Job's mindset was such that even in the midst of the greatest trial he was facing, and probably in his entire life, his mindset went first to himself, and, and that's in saying, I guess you only say, I didn't deserve any of this anyway. It was all from God. And it backed up by the very next statement, God gave, God takes. God's in control here. Uh, he continues on. They came out of my mother's womb, and they shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord had taken away, and then he says these words, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, this did Muriel's funeral, and uh, I know I shared this, but amazing, amazing, <laughs> uh, amazing to me back a couple years ago when her, her phrase was always, praise the Lord. And I remember visiting her, she had had, had cancer early on, I think before or right as we were moving into town, had surgery, had some things that took care of it. And uh, at one point she got word that it had come back or something along those lines. And uh, she's kind of concerned about it. We were visiting her. This is the first time we're here. You know, we're sitting there in her living room. She's sharing with us. She's kind of got tears in her eyes as she's telling. But she's literally scared. Yes. That's quite a few years ago now. And uh, I was kind of concerned. You know, it was not easy the first time. This is not going to be better now. And I remember her telling this, and as my, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm a pastor, I've got to, I'm going to encourage her because she's always so happy, so you know, uplifting that you would visit her to encourage her, and you walk away encouraged when you visit with Muriel. And so my mind is racing. Well, what can I say now? And uh, she finished up her, her story, and then she said, but praise the Lord. And I remember thinking, nothing more needs to be said. Praise the Lord. Literally what Job is saying, blessed be the name of the Lord. What kind of guy would say something like that after he literally has lost all of his wealth? All of his, we can say this way, his retirement, all of the valuable things that he owned on this earth, plus the very things and people that were dearest to him, besides the whole host of servants that he had that are now gone, who says, blessed be the name of the Lord in that circumstance? But you know, when we trust, truly trust God, we are truly able to truly worship in the midst of tragedy. Worship does not mean, uh, well, so-and-so, you know, if your loved one passed away on a Tuesday and I'm going to do my best to be at church on Sunday. Uh, this is not what Job is doing. Job, in the very moment, falls before his face, before his God, and says, blessed be the name of the Lord. It is, this is not about me. This is not something I deserve. This is not something that I'm going to fight for. It's not something that I'm going to get angry about. Uh, uh, God is in control of all of this, and I'm going to give him the praise for it. I'm going to bless him, even in, in this. And uh, I, I can guarantee you that's, that's not normal. That's not easy. Uh, is, do we trust to that extent? Do I trust to that extent that in the midst of this, I will say, not just as a trite statement, but I will say, God be praised. But we want to look not only at his actions and his words, but notice his focus as we look at the last verse here in chapter 1. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In all of this, Job sinned not. Now, let me throw out a few scenarios here. You're on your, I know this does not happen to any of you, or even myself. On your way home from church, you blow a tire. <laughs> in our response to a blown tire on our car, could it be said, in all of that, you said not? We get home and uh, we find an unexpected bill in the mail. Something so small compared to what Job went through, but truthfully, if you got something that you're not expecting and you're counting the pennies, mm -hmm. it can be overwhelming. Not to this extent, but it can be overwhelming. Can it be said of us, in all of that, 
He said not. Well, which means ultimately, and that in fact the rest of the verse says, nor charge God foolishly. It means he had a he had a guard on his anger. He had a guard on his frustration. He had a guard on his blaming others. He had a guard on uh, all the other foolish things that we do in response to the circumstances that we face that are so much smaller than what Job faced. But yet instead of Job, in all this, Job didn't sin, and Job didn't charge God foolishly. And I'm reminded of, of Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. So then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And ultimately what is being said there about our God is that God is under no obligation to anyone. Uh, I will do, basically what God is saying, I will do what I'm going to do. And uh, I'm not obligated to them because of who they are. I'm not obligated to them because of who they aren't. Uh, I will do what I am going to do. And uh, our response is to be able to worship that kind of a God. It's to be able to worship a God that is ultimately in control. Uh, a God that is aware of our hearts, aware of our actions, that's aware of the first 11 verses of this verse of chapter, uh, where God would say, have you considered my servant? And you put in whatever name. And our God would say, hey, God, have you considered my servant? Art? That even if you did all of this to him, it could still be said of him, he sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Why? Because he truly trusted God to the extent that when this happened, Job fell on his face for a holy God, acknowledged that God was in control, blessed the name of God, and somehow managed to not sin or charge God foolishly to it all. And that's true trust. Uh, that is true worship. Um, I don't want to ask, certainly as a pastor, <laughs> But I, I would say as human beings that we, we would have to say that there are times that it's a little easier to worship God, right? Uh, things are going really well. Uh, it's easy to worship God. Things are going kind of difficult. It's kind of harder for us to, uh, what should we say, get in the, just in the mood of worship. I, I just don't, I just don't feel like it. We're looking, I saw, I saw these the two ladies looking at the picture here. You know, something like that would be easy to worship God. It's kind of out there with the, what do you say those words? Poppies, Poppies probably. And uh, just out there, uh, and I love storms. I love the clouds above those as well. Just to be able to imagine you have the breeze blowing in your face and it's just you and nature and there's no expectations from work. There's nobody calling on your phone. Nobody. It's just you and that. And in that scenario, oh, not hard at all to worship God. But let's, turn those clouds into a fierce storm that has destroyed everything that you own, suddenly that very same location is much harder to worship our God. But Job shows us that huh, if we truly trusted him, we could do the same in that as we could in this. And uh, what a reminder for us. Do we truly trust God to that extent? Truly trusting is truly worshiping. Truly worshiping is truly trusting. And uh, we can gauge our trust by how well do I respond when things don't go well. <laughs> when things aren't going uh, the way that I hope that they would. Challenge. I always marvel at the life of Job. I know he's a perfect example of somebody who faced trials. But it's what makes it hard about the life of Job is all Albeit I've never faced what he faced, am I even close to his response in what I have faced? And uh, that's a humbling reminder of uh, what it means to truly trust and what it means to truly worship our God. Any thoughts, conclusions, comments? Anybody like this to go there? <laughs> Every day, I feel like being eight again. <laughs> Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for who you are. We thank you for all of your blessings, all of your goodness. But I pray that we be able to truly trust you to the point that even in the midst of, of trials, even in the midst of circumstances that are not pleasant, even when 
when life throws us curveballs and we find speed bumps in the road, I just pray that you would remind us that you are a God that we can still trust. And that in truly trusting, our normal response will be true worship. And I pray that you would use us, that you would, although I hesitate to say it, that you would stretch us. That you remind us again of who you are. And that you remind us of, of even the life of Job and the heart and the focus that he would have even in the midst of his world being turned completely upside down. That he still understood his position before you. And I thank you for his example. I pray that we'd be able to live that out in our lives, in our example, in our testimony, in, in our circumstance that whatever we face, we give you glory. And I pray that you give us the, uh, the means, the ability, and even the heart to be able to see you in all of that. To your honor and to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.